Uh, Joel and Ethan, I'm going to start with you. I'm curious if the precipitating idea is literary, cinematic. I see there's a reference to a Jack London story in your credits. Where does this story begin for you? Uh, yes, the, well, the Tom Waits story, Old Gold Canyon, is the one uh, story of the six that, um, that we didn't write. That's pretty much a, that's a very faithful adaptation of a Jack London story. Um, so that certainly was, the inspiration for that was certainly literary. <laughs> um, the uh, literary or cinematic, I, I, you know, as far as the other ones are concerned, you know, there have been things that we've done that are have much clearer sort of literary antecedents than I think this other five stories in this do. On the other hand, um, and yeah, I, I would say it's fair enough to say that certain of the stories are, we were consciously thinking of, you know, specific genres of, uh, of Western movies. Um, the James Franco one being, uh, you know, sort of more of this sort of Sergio Leone or spaghetti Western type of thing. And, and just in a general way, we were thinking about other genres, you know, the ones that take place in a stagecoach, the ones that take place, you know, covered wagon story, that sort of thing. Um, but beyond that, uh, not really. Does that mean that within each individual story, you find yourself more free to stick to a certain way of storytelling? That if you don't have to have a cohesive theme across the entire spectrum of the story, you can focus on some narrow convention of the genre within each story more closely? <laughs> Ethan's mulling, thanking. Rejecting, agreeing? I'm thinking. Um, I don't know. I guess you're kind of talking about subgenres or something. I don't quite know. Uh, the reason it, uh, the reason I was thinking and don't quite know what to make of it is because we, uh, I guess they're all genre stories in a way, but we don't really think of them as genre stories. We just think, okay, w what would be good here? And what would be good here is informed by our having seen a lot of movies and read a lot of stories, and mm -hmm. that's all been kind of internalized. But we don't actually, we don't really talk about genre per se. So it's kind of hard. That's all kind of the, this kind of Intuitive. discussion is very much ex post facto <laughs> for us. Well, the other thing is, if you take the first story, for instance, you know, you could say, well, that's clearly that generically, that's pretty clear. It's a singing cowboy movie. But, you know, <laughs> we were only thinking about singing cowboy movies in the sense of singing cowboy movie. Right. Um, the, and that's as far as the sort of uh, the interrogation of the genre went, you know, and then we kind of made it up from there. So, Mary, I want to ask you about your collaborations with Joel and Ethan, but I really want to talk about the first costume you got to design, what it was, and how that set kind of a design template for the whole rest of the film. Well, I, I started in chronological order um, and sort of proposed a, an idea for Tim's, but it was all based on what the character was written on the page. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and then went from there. I mean, I did it in chronological order as well, but I didn't like do one costume and then get the fabric. And it's sort of, it's an, ev it's an evolution. Like first you start with research and then some character boards and then we have a meeting and then I start pulling and we built, we had a f sort of a measurement slash fitting with Tim, tried some hat shapes on him. Can I go this far, mm -hmm. is was the question. And uh, and then we met him again and we had the final, we had the, we had an Im another in-person meeting with you guys and we sort of went through all the stories and they're great, they're very able to imagine how things are go look, going to look with like a sketch and a mm -hmm. pile of fabric and we just divided all the stories on like tabletops in our prep in our shop in at Western Costume, and there, you know, we had a mannequin standing in for Tim, and that's how that's the approach. But they were, you know, yes, I did start with Tim, but I was also thinking about the rest of the film at the same time. If you look really closely in the text and the story of something like the Mule Ticket, it says that he has a bearskin jacket on. How much of that? <laughs> 
you're laughing. So I noticed that. Oh, that, 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 that Liam's coat is a really interesting. That's story, an amazing actually. piece of yeah. fabrication. <laughs> yes, it is. Is it written into the script? This is what he's wearing, or are you having a dialogue? This is what I think he should be wearing. How specific are the cues you're getting from Joel and Ethan? In that case, I don't remember. It, it, it may have been uh, it's something about the. I think that it said it. a bear skin coat, but he's not wearing a bear skin <laughs> coat. But it was implied that it was a big furry thing by that <laughs> description in the script. <laughs> what it actually is is um, sheepskin rugs from IKEA because it was the only <laughs> thing that I could get that dyed all the same color and shaved. He's, um, we he's wearing an IKEA rug. <laughs> <laughs> About 30 Did he have to them. build it himself? There were 30. They were really small. It's a long, long story. <laughs> but oh, I thought it was hysterical when I found out. That's that great. And it really and it looks great. I mean, it's, and it really looks ratty. That was the key. <laughs> Your character is written as a singing cowboy. He's also a dancing cowboy. At what part, part of the process did, was that revealed to you that you were going to... Oh, the dance. <laughs> uh, when I got, I, I always um, try to get to a set uh, no sooner than one week early, but on this one, because of everything I needed to do, two weeks early. And thank God, because um, uh, that um, the second day, Joel said, by the way, we're adding a dance number and we have a dance teacher who's going to come in and work with you. And then that was every day. Uh, and then the dance got changed um, the day of, uh, and uh, I really thanked uh, my lucky stars for um, actor training and many dance classes, <laughs> uh, because um, um, uh, I was able to give them what they wanted uh, um, in changing it. Uh, but, you know, that's uh, the greatest part of an actor's life is, uh, is constant challenges that differ from role to role. It's, it's what we live for. Um, and you never get that like you get it in a Coen Brothers movie. Carter, there are two things that tie these stories together. One is the visual landscape, and the second is the oral landscape, that you have to knit together a soundscape that's going to tie these stories together, and also not only reflect kind of the genre and the conventions of the genre, but also do something new. So where do you come in? Do you start with a particular story or do you step back and say, this might be the overall theme to the film and it's gonna change in these particular ways for these particular characters? Well, I think before they shot, we had uh, some casual discussions about the different chapters. And as I recall, at some point someone said, and could you tie it all together somehow? You know? <laughs> Basically, um, and then when they got back from shooting, uh, that tying it all together became like that was the most important thing. Really, it seemed at first. Uh, uh, so um, I did attempt to find something, some some thread that could be put through it all. Because I guess at that point, you know, it's been written, it's been shot. The you know the only thing that can be done at that point is with music. Um, and I have to say, I kind of failed. I. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I did try a lot of different ways to, to um, you know, to do that, to, to thread it, but uh, the stories are so different, the look so different, the tone so different, that it was, um, you know, it just felt forced every time I would try to do something uh, like that. They, each of them really had to be their own thing, and um, uh, so we... In the end, we came up with a, this, um, the idea of at least bookending it, so at the beginning when the book is open and at the end when the book is closed, we use um, the Streets of Laredo tune that Brendan Gleeson sings at the end. And it seems completely appropriate, a song, a well-known song about death that's known as a cowboy ballad, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, the idea of like somehow really unifying it all uh, <clears throat> as a canvas, I never quite you know, was able to do. Well, you know, it's interesting because it was a similar discussion with Carter that we had with Bruno, because just from visually how much we should... Your cinematographer. Yeah, the cinematographer in terms of, uh, you know, how individualistic the looks of the different stories should be as opposed to um, maybe they all have the same look, for instance. But the great thing, I mean, that really, I mean, that's part of what's 
and again, we've been making mo movies with Carter since the very beginning. I mean, one of the things is that allows you to do is, and it was evident in this process, I think, is you go down certain roads and then it kind of declares itself, you know, what I'm, which direction you should be going. But you have to be doing that with somebody who's going to understand at the same time you do how it's declaring itself, what the proper solution is. And that was really kind of, in a way, this was an interesting movie in that regard because the discussion was about that. Yeah, I think more, you know, more than the other films we've done, we didn't understand how much the structure was going to <laughs> complicate it, honestly. I don't think that we really foresaw that. When you get on set and you have a chance to act opposite actors that Joel and Ethan and their casting directors have picked, what does that change in terms of the dynamics of performance that you are essentially almost, it almost feels like you're doing theater in some ways? Uh, well, this was a very special one for me for the obvious, the obvious reasons, um, but also because Bill Heck and I did Angels in America together um, eight years ago now. We played husband and wife in that. Um, uh, and so when I saw him in the, the lobby of the building that we went for a callback, I was um, pretty excited because um, I felt you know, we have like <laughs> six months of doing Tony Kushner together, which is <laughs> like a going to war, um, metaphorically. Uh, I obviously know that <laughs> it's nothing like going to war, um, but um, uh, you know, it made a big difference for me just having m someone I really trusted and. Uh, Granger Hines, who plays Mr. Arthur, is also a really lovely dude, and it did feel a little bit like um, a month of just being in this tiny company of actors, the way it feels like when you're in a theater company. Thank you so much.